Hi, my name is Liz Nord, and my favorite things are documentary films. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we learn about people's favorite things without using an algorithm. I'm so excited. This afternoon, I am with one of my OG going to Israel friends. Uh, I'm I'm here today with um, Liz Nord. She's an executive producer who started in the news and documentaries. She makes documentaries, podcasts, m- multimedia, online content. Most recently, Liz worked at Sundance, and she's here today with us on Finding Favorites. Liz, how are you? Hi, Leah Jones. I'm so excited to be here. It's so good to be catching up with you. I was so thrilled when you sent me your email. I'm like, how have I not had Liz on yet? You had a podcast before almost anyone I knew. And oh. yet you, I hadn't, I didn't ask you to be on. That's on me. Well, yeah. So that your listeners know, I, I literally like, I asked, I requested to be on the podcast. Yes. I'm a fan of both Leah's and of the podcast. And I was like, I have favorite things. So, yeah. so here we are. I'm so happy. So we were doing a little catching up before I hit record and talking, just reflecting a little bit. We met in, I think, the summer of 2007 at a conference in Israel. Is that right? Was Is that, did you go 2007? Uh, no, I think I was like the year after you. It might have been. Did you go another year? Yeah, I 2008, did. 2008, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's been a while. Yeah. And at the time, your documentary, were you still working on Jericho's Echo? in 2008 or was it just it had been out in the world which I think is why I was invited to this conference you know with like Jewish artists and and Mm -hmm. and Jewish you know innovators people creating Jewish things in the world and my my film Jericho's Echo was not specifically Jewish but it was about Israeli punk rockers and so I think it fit it fit the bill yeah so we 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 met then we see each other at conferences we run we see each other at conferences weddings f- funerals when your dad has art shows in New York when my dad has art shows in New York yes we've got to get you guys out to Chicago absolutely yeah. i really really want to go to the Chicago Museum is the contemporary art museum the one that's right downtown i've been once before and i loved it so much the Art Institute of Chicago, which is the massive yeah, I think everything that's what I'm one, thinking of like near the Bean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then there's also a Museum of Contemporary Art, which is stunning. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Art Institute of Chicago is, is the one. It's got. I mean, it's just got everything. It's, yeah, it's I was got, amazed by that yeah. museum. And I live in New York. You know, it's not like I don't have access to culture. But yeah, I'd love to come back. Also, good yeah. food. Mm. Well, we've got very good food in Chicago. Just like it's maybe true. not this season. Like I'll come in no. the spring. Yeah, no, don't come in the winter. <laughs> don't come in the winter. Um, it's a it's a great spring summer visit. Absolutely. Not to no spoilers, but we're going to be talking documentaries. But I'm curious as we head into winter, do you have any? And this will most likely be a Christmas episode. Do you have any winter repeat movies, like any winter traditions that that are movie related? Oh, I love that question. I mean, winter is like prime time for movies. And obviously mm-hmm. all the like holiday stuff comes out on the big screen, which I will say that everything, uh, all the recommendations I'm going to make today, I know we're going to get to talk about some films. I tried to find things that are very contemporary and all available on streaming. But Amazing. I still believe in the in you know the the in person, in theater film going experience, especially mm-hmm. for the blockbusters. So I usually do try to get to some of the like ones that come out between Thanksgiving and Christmas every year to like have that communal big screen big mm-hmm. audio like experience. So this year, um, it was Wakanda Forever, the new Black yeah. Panther film and I feel like the Black Panther like canon as it grows will be like an annual Mm -hmm. you know viewing because it's just like they're just so like lush 
and beautiful. They're not really your typical comic book movies. Yeah. Um, and like deep, you know, they have like kind of a deeper meaning, but I love oh. all that stuff. So, you know, and I will say that the Harry Potter films always make like a good seasonal, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you can watch several. They all have, almost all of them have a Christmas scene, you know, or like a winter scene because they go through the school year. So those are always fun. And I'm like, a total Star Wars geek, so I'll yeah. always revisit the films. Have to say, not like loving all the series so much, mm-hmm. even though I'm excited that they exist in the world. Yeah. Um, but I will always go back to the films, especially the you know the originals. Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, I I saw Wakanda Forever a couple weeks ago, mm. and um, I went and saw it in 4DX. Have you wow, done that? What even is that? <laughs> <laughs> so 3D, right? Three dimensions. 4D, fourth dimension. It's the Ooh. fourth dimension experience. The chair is a roller coaster. <laughs> oh, wow. Every four chairs are connected <sighs> and they tilt forward and back, side to side. Oh, they my vibrate. God. Um, there's there's like a fan behind you. So if there's a breeze going through the jungle, it's a little breeze on your neck. If a bullet goes by your face, you, they do this like... Um, really quick puff of air past your neck so you feel the bullet go by. Shut up. And um, it's... we. I, I went with my friend Ronnie. We had never gone before. We really didn't look into too much what, a, what 4DX was about. And <coughs> we laughed hysterically through the whole movie because our chairs... I was just chairs... going to say, I feel like I'd be <laughs> laughing the whole time. I wouldn't even be able to like... <laughs> wow. Don't... Don't don't do 4DX for a movie you want to emotionally connect to. So wow. we felt very self-conscious being two white people in the middle of Black Panther Wakanda forever in laughing Chicago. in Chicago as our chairs kept like jolting us. Oh, my God. You couldn't have been the only ones. People must have been laughing. <laughs> Luckily, it was like a Tuesday or a Thursday night. And mm. it was it was there were only 10 of us maybe in the theater. Um, and so we were all having our reactions um, but I am very excited to see Avatar in a 4DX. That, a, sounds, that sounds like a good move for yeah. Avatar. For people that haven't seen it, Wakanda Forever is sort of sort of surprisingly emotional for a comic book yeah. movie, particularly because, you know, its lead, its original lead, the original Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman, passed away between the first and second films, and they honor him mm-hmm. and his sort of contribution to the films um, right from the... Right from the beginning, I mean, people in the theater when I saw it were crying. Right, which is the appropriate emotion. <laughs> but as his sister walks through the lab in that first scene, and your chair goes kaboom, kaboom, kaboom with her steps. Oh my god! And, and like your chair is like moving with her steps, and you just start laughing from then, and it's not a laughing scene. No, um, I also feel like like not a great situation to have like popcorn on your lap. No, we did not. <laughs> thankfully, we did not take we did not get popcorn. Um, there were people behind us who had like a soda. And I, I, I'm not kidding when I say I had to hold on for dear life to not get thrown out of the chairs at times. Oh, my God. I so, don't know if that's for me. Um, I wish they would make like a 45 minute 40X experience that was like Star Wars, like Star Wars battles. Like, made for um, it. That makes a lot yeah. more sense. Like, how they used to make films for the IMAX, and they were yeah. so incredible in that environment. Right. And now they just show regular films on IMAX, which mm-hmm. always feels kind of weird to me. Yeah. So I'm not looking forward. I mean, I'm. that's how we're going to see Avatar, because otherwise I don't really care about seeing Avatar. Mm-hmm. But enough. I have to say the 3D trailer for it before Wakanda Forever, What it, it was a stunning use of 3D. I mean, so. that sounds that sounds pretty cool. And it's funny because, like, we're talking about documentaries today. So right. I'm thinking about, you know, what, is, what, what does this mean for a documentary? And I think, you know, what the documentaries that I really love are immersive, you know, what they call immersive, mm-hmm. where you, you find yourself in this other world. But I don't know that, like, in a doc, you'd want to be, like, as immersed as a 4D experience. <laughs> it's I funny to think about. I need more people to go so I can talk to more people about how insane the ex- i mean there you know the big fight on top of the ship in wakanda forever right mm-hmm. your chair punches you in the back 
as okay. they're like fighting on top like no. you're feeling like fists in your back yeah I'd be like bye bye <laughs> unless it's like a massage but you know it's somewhere but, but it's it's more like a sharper image massage chair but it's happening as punches are landing on the screen oh my gosh so I, I just I need more people to go <laughs> talk to me about this ridiculous uh, I, I don't think you need a chair that moves as a reason to go to the theater. I think you need to be with people. Like, I think the and value like good of food being, and like, yeah, I like the comfy chairs now that lean mm-hmm. back. Like, yes. yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said for it. Yeah. I mean, I went and saw Jackass forever <laughs> in theaters twice. Wow. Just to I, make sure I see it, saw it like with people. I would like to maybe unpack that with you another time. Yeah. What I'll say about Jackass is that it is possibly one of the greatest documentaries about male friendship ever made. How about now, that? That is not what I ever would have expected you to say. So I am, you know, color me intrigued. That they are, I think it's especially Jackass Forever, because at this point they've been doing it for 20 years. Everyone right. involved in the fourth movie, the the jackass guys if they weren't sober they weren't invited back like bam's not there because bam's not sober mm. and they've supported each other through sobriety and through finding other businesses through starting families and and there's i mean there are there's drinking on on it because there's younger people and but there's really like you don't often see on film men who have been friends with each other for 20 years, working and laughing together, punching each other in the nuts and hugging it out. Like I felt like it was a really positive portrayal of a evolved male friendship. That is really, really cool. I love hearing that. And like note to self, definitely don't see that movie in 4D. (laughs) Absolutely not. (laughs) Do not need my nuts punched. No. <laughs> no. So when you come to Chicago, I'll take you to a movie at the Music Box. Yes. Which is one of our art house, amazing theaters with a, still has an organ player. So there's organs, organ player before the Saturday matinees. Oh, I love that. And I went, it's 700 people, 700 people in the house. Wow. Big house. So I went there, sold out for RRR. Oh, I've heard such good things about that movie. It's like on the list. Mm-hmm. It's on that winter list. Yeah. So I think it will It was it was the most incredible, probably, live theater experience I've ever had in my whole life. Wow, because people were so into it? People were cheering, clapping. I would say that and everything everywhere all at once, mm. which I also saw in a big theater sold out. That was a great one to see in a theater. Mm-hmm. So wild. Yeah. And those those guys, the Daniels, the filmmakers are really interesting. I interviewed them once. Um, I used to run a website called No Film School, uh, like by filmmakers, Mm -hmm. for filmmakers. And so interviewed lots of uh, filmmakers. And those guys are, the the directors are like these kind of like young, goofy guys. And they've done amazing work, um, always kind of like pushing the envelope like they did with this film. Um, And yeah, it's always nice when like, Filmmakers who seem like good people are also mm-hmm. doing well in the world and their films yeah. are getting traction. Yeah, I'm glad to see that one getting the nominations I think it deserved. Also, like um, Michelle Yeoh, like she's mm. just so rad. And the fact that she's now having this like big sort of second coming, even though mm-hmm. she's been in the industry for what, like 40 years. Yeah. I mean, what a badass. I love her. Yeah, she's phenomenal. Yeah, I think our winter film traditions well i'm jewish i'm the only i converted so my family's not jewish so when we go to my sisters for christmas we watch bad santa oh okay uh we watch elf christmas vacation yeah i mean i've seen them all you know when you when you grow up jewish in this country you you Mm -hmm. can't avoid christmas right um and some of them are really fun i love i I have a weak spot for um emmett otter's jug band christmas yes very sweet i'm i love muppets yeah um and and then my sister will play uh she's gotten a really good pandora station of like jazzy christmas 
tunes. Oh, can you send that to me? I will. Yes. I do love Christmas music as well. Mm-hmm. Much of which was written by Jews. There's a documentary about it. Oh. Okay, Liz, as promised, we're here to talk about documentaries, but I wanted, and I know you have lots of great recommendations, which I am so excited for, but my first question is, why documentaries? Like, how, do you remember seeing your first documentary, or do you remember the first documentary that, like, really punched you in the gut, and you're like, I gotta know more about this? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, You know, I think like most people, although documentaries are much more like prominent and available on all the streamers now, like when I was a kid, I never would have told you, oh, I want to grow up and go into documentary because Mm -hmm. I thought documentaries were like, you know, historical, boring things on PBS or like nature docs, which are Mm -hmm. fun to watch, but not like you know, a career path for me. Sure. And then it's sort of this like true crime, like none of that really appealed to me, but the idea of documentary filmmaking and like filmmaking was always exciting. Mm -hmm. Or actually the idea of filmmaking itself was exciting. That's what I, what I originally went to undergrad for. Okay. I ended up leaving that major and funny enough, like I said, later running a, a website called No Film School, and I'm still like, no, you don't really need film school. <laughs> right. But like, it was a it was a strong interest, and then um, I ended up becoming a graphic designer and, and came back to filmmaking. But part of what got me back to it was that I am one of those people that other people just talk to, mm-hmm. like strangers all the time, tell me you their stories. The you got the I don't face. know. You got the vibe. Yes. So, like, there was, like, this one moment, I remember pretty clearly on the bus in San Francisco where I used to live um, and where I started my doc career, and I was in my, like, early 20s, and this woman on the bus who I did not make eye contact with, Mm -hmm. like, really had no reason to talk to me, but sat next to me and started telling me in detail about her recent divorce, Mm. and I, I thought, like... I need to do something with this. Like, this happens to me all the time. Right. Enough that, like, I should go some direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly there's some kind of calling. I can't, even when I'm not trying, people are divulging their lives to me. So, I guess I could have gone, you know, toward, like, sociology or therapy, um, you know, psychiatry. But I was already in the sort of media making business. And it was like, wait a minute. You know what makes sense? is to put all this together, let people talk to me, I'll just turn on a camera. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of really how, how I became a documentary filmmaker. And of course, once I, once I started you know, learning more about the practice, I also watched tons of films and learned, oh my God, there's this whole massive world of independent documentary films that yeah. I had not had much access to previously. And it was like, oh, this is something really different. These are... These are like emotionally resonant, relevant, kind of beautiful films that aren't like formulaic historical docs. And I don't mean Mm -hmm. to be dissing historical docs. I actually think, especially now, there's like historical docs or docs that cover historical topics that are really fascinating. But But I think it's uh, not like this male narrator telling you about blah, blah, blah. Like you feel like you're in history class. I would say that women of our age, uh, we're... uh, Women in our 40s. Wow. I didn't know you were going to be divulging our age to the entire <laughs> audience. Huh. We, okay. are plus, we are plus or minus 10 years. Yes. That's right? great. Yep. Women in um, our 30s or 40s. <laughs> as women in our 40s, we are we were primed for that, that stretch of PBS where a documentary was a Ken Burns multi-part sepia-toned documentary a hundred percent that's what i'm talking about and that's all we knew so absolutely like once you learn there's more than ken burns there's a whole world of ken more than him a massive world and just you know so people who might not be as familiar with the field understand kind of generally what i'm talking about is that like when i say an independent film there's like this independent space where like an independent filmmaker meaning they're not necessarily uh, tied to a studio 
or anything like that. They've sort of raised their own money or they've gotten financing outside of a streamer or studio so that they can kind of follow their own whims and storytelling instincts. And that's where a lot of the, you know, films that I'm interested in, the people that I cover and work with and, you know, promote and, and, and everything, um, that's the space that we live in. And to kind of go back to your other question, so, you know, I, I started exploring the field. I took a couple classes um, in San Francisco at a place that um, no longer exists, but it was a wonderful organization called the Film Arts Foundation, where you could just show mm. up and kind of like learn to use a camera um, without having to go to, to graduate school or anything. I started attending, you know, getting involved in the local film scene in San Francisco, which was pretty robust at the time, and starting to attend the festivals. And, and a couple that do stand out in those early years, like in terms of experiences, like film experiences where I was like, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. One um, was at the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, probably in like 2004-ish. Um, I, I made my first film in 2005. Um, there was a film called Trembling Before God, which uh, someone who's now a good friend, Sandy yes. Lubowski, made. And it was sort of this like pivotal doc about um, Orthodox Jews who are gay coming out and or like figuring out how to navigate their their worlds where that wasn't as acceptable of a lifestyle or wasn't acceptable at all. Um, and, and I saw the film live with an audience at the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. And in the film itself, one of the characters' faces is blurred. You can't see them um, because it would be dangerous they would or be uncomfortable. Or, right. right. Like they couldn't really be on film recognizably. Mm -hmm. So we saw the film. It was really moving. And then that character came out on stage, first time publicly, sort of showing her face and saying, I'm gay. And the audience went, freaking bananas wow. understandably and it was just like it was so moving and so like oh like this <coughs> is what a documentary can be and right. can do and like I want to be part of that and that it can be contemporary totally. it can be of things of the mm -hmm. moment and not just a hundred plus years ago piecing together through through archival footage right and yeah. like and and that film like followed these it's it's protagonists like in their daily life, you know, it was very present, very, mm -hmm. yeah, very, very of the of the moment. So that was really cool. And one other one um, was at, at South by Southwest, which um, became kind of like my annual pilgrimage after the first year I went, which probably was 2005-ish. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went like 10 or, you know, like somewhere between 10 and 15 more years after that. But the first year I was like, this is so cool because I went and like declared I'm a filmmaker, you know, I like yeah. went to this film festival, f film and media and everything festival. And I was like, I too am a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw the premiere of Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me, which like, wow. you know, yeah, I mean, the film is like fine. It's debatable. People love it. They hate yeah. it. But the Austin, that, that festival happens in Austin, Texas. The crowds are super enthusiastic. They screen at this really cool movie theater called the Alamo Draft House that like mm -hmm. serves beer and everything while you're watching the films. And again, you know, the beauty of going to film festivals is that often the filmmaker is there. So saw the film, Morgan Spurlock shows up, you know, since then he's become very famous, but this was his first like yeah. documentary of note. Again, the audience went so wild and that Austin crowd is so enthusiastic. And I just thought it wasn't as much about the content of the film, but I was like, oh, like this is the rock star I want to be. Uh -huh. I, I don't want to be, I've never aspired to like be in a band or whatever, but like that's the rock star I want to be. The one that like shows their film to this like, you know, rapidly enthusiastic crowd uh -huh. and like gets to talk about it. And, you know, that film will then live on and have its own sort of life and trajectory and influence in the world. That was like super exciting to me. Wow. Those are two... Wait, now somebody's ringing my doorbell. I felt like I heard a doorbell. Hold on. Okay, so you were saying those are two. We talked about Super Size Me Super and Totally Forgot. And you said those are two really. Yeah, and then a doorbell rang and my brain went boom. I'm just thinking about the, you know, I have also gotten to meet Sandy from Trembling Before God. Not, mm. he's, I think I met him at maybe at the conversation. So we're Facebook friends, we're acquaintances, we're not friends. Um, but certainly that piece resonated through the Jewish community 
mm-hmm. continues to resonate. Mm-hmm. And then Morgan Spurlock, you know, Super Size Me, it was such a massive global sensation. That's um, one of the ones that kind of put more modern documentaries on the map. Yeah. Um, and showed the the role, you know, there, there's still a role for it. sometimes investigative, sometimes experiential documentary making. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I just love that those were theater experiences for you. Yeah. And also, you know, what I thought you were going to say when you said, you know, when you were commenting <laughs> on these two films is that the, I think it also kind of like proves my point, even though, you know, I do want to talk about more modern films, but just like those are part of a modern wave and they're two totally different films mm-hmm. in tone, in style and structure. And neither of them are what one might ex- like who might have historically expected when they heard the word documentary. Yeah. So you go to South by Southwest, you stake your claim. I am a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And then you make your first, you, you are your first director, the first producer. You're like, what is, are you like on the crew of a documentary? I know I said I wasn't going to make you talk about your career the whole time, but I guess I've never gotten to ask you some of these questions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I had, you we've know, known each other so long, but long I've never time. said like because I remember you like literally carrying a camera, or or like meeting. Wasn't like Zach Tem Zachary Tem one of your? Was he like your camera guy on one of your Jerusalem movies? Oh no, we never worked together. No, but we had people in common. And um, when I moved to New York, he was one of the first people that like helped me get into the New York film scene as part of a. a collective called the film shop but i don't think that's like that relevant but i was filming in jerusalem you know another project in jerusalem a few years later when we might have seen each other at the roi union okay yeah that makes sense. but anyway so yeah so so early in my career um i was taking those classes in san francisco i decided instead of going to grad school i would buy a camera and make myself into a filmmaker Mm -hmm. I always tell people this because like there's so much about sort of just like believing and putting out there that you are doing this thing. Yeah. Whatever it is. And, you know, I I coach creatives a lot. Um, And at that South by Southwest, I had already started making Jericho's Echo. So I really was in the process of making a film, but I made myself a business card. We used to do that. Um, Yeah. And it said Liz Nord, filmmaker. And it was like as soon as I sort of put it on paper and like told people, it felt real. And it became more real, um, which is which is pretty cool. And I, I still need to remind myself of that. Sometimes, right. you know, like 20 years into my career, I still get imposter syndrome. You know, it, it happens. So, yeah. Um, but um, when I really, really started before making it a, a feature documentary was doing um, what is called video activism. So kind of documenting stuff that that is happening in the community Mm -hmm. with sort of an activist bent and around that time was when the Iraq war was starting and I lived in San Francisco which is a very progressive place and so we were doing um, I was part of a group called street level tv Mm -hmm. and we had a show on the cable access in San Francisco and I would go and film like Iraq war protests and and things of that nature so I, I was really you know I started out like pretty scrappy like right out there literally in the streets that's I mean I didn't know that that's so cool it was cool looking back on it Mm -hmm. I mean yeah it was a moment for sure and it wasn't um I think what's important to note is that it just wasn't so common then like you don't really need video activists anymore because everybody has a camera and is Mm -hmm. documenting whatever is going on around them thank goodness like like thank goodness that for example, police brutality has now, be, you know, come much more to light because people with cell phones have just exposed mm-hmm. that. Um, but at the time, cell phones didn't um, even have video cameras. It is, it's amazing because right. it's not that long ago. Um, but so, so it took people like us to actually go out there with camera cameras and, and make sure to be noting this, this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was really important because there – because – Everybody couldn't document. It's it's wild. Things have changed so much. So much. And and that's part of what's been so exciting about being in this field is that it has just changed so rapidly and documentaries mm-hmm. have become so much more ubiquitous and like your listeners can go see all sorts of like fascinating stuff that just wasn't really out there before if you if you didn't go to the art house or you weren't, you know, 
like part of an educational institution that had a DVD, you know, Mm -hmm. it's amazing. Yeah. So I want to ask you about if you're going to a film festival, Mm -hmm. um, which I know you often do. How are you approaching the documentary slate? Assuming you're not a judge. Are Mm -hmm. you looking for topics that you like? Are you looking for filmmakers you've heard of? Like, how do you start to prioritize a festival slate? Well, that's a great question because because I've been as an audience and I've also been Mm -hmm. as press. And so I really have had to like sort of study the programs and kind of figure that out, like how to navigate all that. Mm Mm-hmm. But when I'm not going as press, which, of course, most people wouldn't be going, um, I actually love to be surprised. So and that's one of the amazing things, especially going to a festival like Sundance, because Sundance happens in January. Mm -hmm. And um, that means, you know, of course, it's the head of the year. It's also the head of the film year. um, And it requires not all festivals do, of course, but Sundance requires that you're having your film's premiere so that means Mm. that like if your film has played anywhere else um at least in north america it it will not you know it wouldn't be uh, eligible for sundance so that means as audiences you have this real gift of going to see films that you just haven't heard much about yet Mm -hmm. and so i usually do a combination of you know at this point i know so many filmmakers Uh, which is another just great privilege. So I'll try to see films by people I know Mm -hmm. um, to support them. Um, And sometimes I just go blind, like, whatever, let's just give this a shot. That's why we're here. And that's always really fun. And then um, I like to kind of look outside the box. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are some films that you know when you go to a festival are going to have distribution Or they're already, um, for example, a Netflix film. So you know it's going to be on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Or it's such a big name director that like it'll definitely get out there to the public. So I'll often look for the films by, say, a first time filmmaker or um, just something like slightly less obscure or like that hasn't secured distribution yet so that I can make sure to try to see that film, um, you know, when I get the chance. Right. Because there's because it will be. You're trying to see the things that you might not have another opportunity in theater to see. That's right. Mm-hmm. And while this whole conversation might not feel like super relevant to everyone because you can't necessarily go to film festivals, I would highly recommend that people seek out festivals in their area um, because film festivals are so ubiquitous now that there's often like, you know, small local film festivals like almost everywhere. And especially because of the pandemic, a lot of the big festivals are now making some of the films available streaming. So right. Sundance this year, which is coming up in January, you can buy tickets to some of the, the premieres online, which is pretty freaking cool if That's you're sitting cool. in, you know, Idaho and w- would never get yourself to Sundance. Actually, Idaho right. isn't that far from Sundance. Right. <laughs> but if you're sitting in Maine and, yeah. and you couldn't, you know, get yourself to Sundance or didn't have really a reason to go to Sundance, you can see some of these films, which I think is really one of the you know, silver linings, I guess, of the pandemic. Yeah. Obviously, it rather would have not had the pandemic, but this is one of those those outgrowths that is positive. Yeah, that things have become more accessible. Some things have become more accessible. Yes, and literally more accessible. For example, Sundance, again, never did um, uh, closed captioning on the live screenings. So it cut out, you know, a whole audience that required, like a deaf audience, for example, that that would require closed captioning. And now you can stream with closed captioning for a premiere, which is pretty special. That is really special. Wow. Well, let's let's get into some of your recommendations. Woo. Yeah, I know you (laughs) you've got you've been working on the list. Um, yes. so when you started thinking about, I want to tell people to watch these documentaries, how do you categorize documentaries in your, like, are you like, these are shorts, these are long, these are mm. men, these are like, how do you, how do you categorize it? Or are you just like, this is what I'm loving right now? That is a great question. I'm like a category person, like a kind uh-huh. of like a list organizing person. 
I guess that comes from like my producing background. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do categorize and I will say, I'm glad you brought up shorts because I did not really include shorts on this list. Let me tell you, like this is finding favorites, right? So it's so hard to find, to pick (laughs) my favorites. Like you guys, I have seen like a good, like nine billion documentaries. And so already like narrowing down longs as I, I love that you say mm-hmm. longs I think the appropriate term is feature length but longs is awesome I'm gonna use it <laughs> from now on so my like list that I really came up with to talk about today are longs but okay I think shorts are a really fun way to get into docs like if you're listening to this and you're like oh yeah I was one of those people that thought documentaries was boring were boring mm-hmm. um shorts are such a great way in and I really actually think it's kind of like the golden age of the short documentary and People can see shorts, of course, online. And if you want things more curated, there are a lot of uh, of ways to see shorts that like someone else has already gone through. And the great thing about a short is if you don't like it, like it's going to be over soon. Mm -hmm. So there's sites, for example, New York Times, OpDocs. I mean, that's so well curated. There's some that are less well known, like one called Short of the Week. It's a website and another one called Omleto. Um, I'll, I'll send you the links uh, to share with everybody, but like there's some amazing places where you can watch really high quality documentary shorts, um, online. Cool. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I know that sometimes in festivals, well, I don't think this is sometimes because it's hard to move people. (laughs) Moving bodies is complicated. Mm -hmm. They'll do a shorts block. So you'll go in and you'll watch three to ten shorts and that's yes, like a that's block very common and there's yeah. there's usually like several several blocks i mean imagine this and I, I know i keep talking about sundance but it's because that's like where i most recently um worked for the past mm-hmm. four years but like they so the shorts programmers there they say that they watch every single submission which is an incredible feat because there are almost ten thousand short submissions a year so, like, you know oh that God. the ones that get through that, you know, that gate or whatever are, like, going to be pretty strong. But there's this kind of why I say it's a golden age of shorts, because there's just so many people making shorts now that the gear and the sort of right. technology is so much more accessible. That means there's a lot more crap out there, but it also means mm-hmm. there's a lot more great stuff. And I'll, I'll make one other note, too, because um, I think this episode is going to come out um Soon, on Christmas you know, morning. On Christmas. Oh my God! People will gift. unwrap this on Christmas what morning. A gift. Yes. Um, so this is so it's a perfect time to mention that um, also every year the Oscars puts in. I don't know who actually makes it, but somebody makes on behalf of the Oscars the Oscar nominated shorts programs mm-hmm. in theaters across the country. Yes. So and I always have so much fun watching those. And then when you watch the Oscars, you actually know what the shorts are. Mm-hmm. Um. So I would, uh, you know, recommend that folks look in their local local theaters for the Oscar nominated shorts programs. And there's usually, you know, the documentary one is its own screening. I love going to the best uh, animated shorts mm-hmm. nominations and the best live action shorts as yeah. well. So that's always a fun thing to do in like January, early February. Yeah. Th- and I th- yes, those are for sure available in Chicago. And I don't you don't have to be in a major city. You just have to be in a town with a theater with somebody who loves movies, yes. who still loves movies, yes. and you'll, you'll get the chance to see them. <laughs> so to get back to your question. Yes. Uh, Tell me way, about your longs. Yes, my longs. <laughs> so the way that I, I kind of thought about categories was like almost like in opposition to the the categories that, um, that we talked about earlier, like the mm-hmm. typical categories of like historical, animal, true crime, like those are categories. But there's yeah. all these other categories. And of course, like you could split out by gender, country, whatever. That's also really interesting. But but my categories are like, yeah, my categories. Um, and I think some of them are like sort of accepted in the industry as categories. Um, so so I have a, a bunch of I ended up like coming up with a bunch of categories. I'm trying to figure out like like how to even like narrow down to share with everyone because this could um, take all day. So I'm going to, I'm going to start and we'll see where we get. But, um, because we had talked about, because we had talked about trembling before God, Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, supersize me earlier, maybe I'll, I'll bring us up to date on some more kind of contemporary, uh, 
docs that are like in those general categories. So like, for example, um, trembling before God, it, it might fall into the sort of like modern, like observational or cinema, cinema verite category Mm -hmm. and, or the character centered doc. There's a lot of overlap between the two of those, but like cinema verite is the classic documentary mode if, if folks have heard of like Albert Maisel's and the Maisel's brothers and and other um really famous longtime documentarians that's the, its idea of like the quote-unquote fly on the wall okay but more contemporary filmmakers have acknowledged that you're not really a fly on the wall right that, like being in the room changes the room it changes the room yeah a, a little bit so so these are like observational documentaries meaning like the camera's just turned on and you're watching life um, but just with a little more self-awareness by the filmmakers. Um, and so does I, that mean so they've um, that there's not like a voiceover oh, telling exactly, you it's, exactly it's you you as the viewer are learning the story based on the scenes the I mean cinema verite that's like true cinema verite yeah or like truth is what it's talking about like documentaries are supposed to expose some kind of truth right but then that gets really muddy too because exactly like we said well there's a filmmaker in the room is everything really true right i will say that part of the reason i love documentaries and why they're favorites is because so often the story behind the scenes is like just as interesting as Mm -hmm. the story in front of the camera of course the audience doesn't always learn those but like even though these are verite you know they're meant to really feel true to life and you're watching this thing unfold, there are usually hundreds of hours of footage taken yeah. for a 90 minute doc. Right. And so it is a true story that's unfolding before your eyes, but it has been very edited to sort of yeah. create a compelling story out of, you know, all this mundane stuff that happens in life. Right. So, so one of the ones I love was was nominated Oscar nominated a couple of years ago, the Truffle Hunters. Um, hmm. This was directed by two guys, Michael Dweck and Gregory Kershaw, and it's basically about men, um, old dudes in Italy who are truffle hunters. They are searching for um, th- their job is to go into the forests of Italy with their dogs it's actually not not boars or pigs that they use huh. with their very sweet dogs and seek out truffles and it's like this is an example of like like why would i ever watch like that sounds so boring but mm-hmm. somehow you know the filmmakers have found these delightful characters and created these scenes that are just so beautiful to watch and and what's so amazing about docs like this is that you get this really really up close and intimate peek into a world you just never would have known about and um, and it's like really funny and delightful. Like there's, you know, there's one guy in the film where his dog, his truffle hunting dog is really like his BFF. He lives alone Aww. with the dog. He feeds the dog at the dinner table. They sit there every night chatting away. Uh, and during the day they go out and, you know, tr- search for these extremely rare, extremely valuable truffles. It's just this little slice of life that is so delightful. And, um, you know, again, these filmmakers just sort of like, just watch these guys. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a little bit of voiceover. Sometimes it's it's common where there's not a narrator, but the voiceover might come from the protagonists themselves. So okay. they might be sort of talking you through what they had done or the scene <coughs> that you're watching. Um, and you get to know them a little bit that yeah. way. But then that also crosses over to this kind of character-based, um, you know, documentary. So in this... In in, the, in um, the Truffle Hunters, like, they are characters and, and, you know, well, characters, I would say, is not a really PC word to use anymore in the doc world. Mm-hmm. They're protagonists, they're participants. Okay. Um, so they, like, yes, we're watching their lives, but it's more about, like, the scene and the situation and the lifestyle and their little stories. And then mm-hmm. there are character-centered docs, which are really, like, focusing on one person and their sort of fascinating trajectory. So it's funny, I did not realize this when I was making the list, but I'm having like an old man moment because <laughs> the, uh, one of the character center docs that came to mind um, was another Oscar nominated doc um, 
by a female Chilean filmmaker. Um, I don't actually know how to pronounce her name. It's, it's, it's Maite, M-A-I-T-E, um, Alberti. She made this film called The Mole Agent. Did you hear about this one? No. Okay, so again, another old guy story. So this 80s, basically like this lonely old man is at home alone um, and he he gets he he gets this like invitation or he sees a notice tacked up. I don't remember how he found out about it, but he basically found out that a local detective agency was looking for an elderly detective to infiltrate a nursing home to see if they could find signs of abuse. Mm-hmm. So this guy like tries out and he gets in, he gets the part and he's like trains as uh, kind of, you know, as a secret agent, basically, and mm-hmm. ha- gets this whole new lease on life. Um, but what happens, you know, without giving too much away, is that even though he's there as this, like, investigator, he also is an old person in this old person's, you know, residence, mm-hmm. and everyone kind of falls in love with him, and he becomes, like, and some of them literally... I don't know if you've right. ever been to, like, a, a, you know, an assisted living kind of place, but there's often many more women than men just for oh, life expectancy. Oh, I was at my great aunt's funeral, and my Uncle Jimmy could still drive, and he was a charming man, and there were women who had been waiting since high school for him to be single again. Oh, my God. It's for real. At the funeral with casseroles. That's, that is, yeah. Yeah, I, um, as a side note, I also was at, uh, I visited my wonderful aunt Mm -hmm. uh, before she passed away several times at one of these places and I brought my boyfriend at the time with me once (laughs) and this older lady like like basically hit on him by pulling up the bottom of her pants and like showing off her ankle and was Mm -hmm. like hey sailor or whatever I don't even know what she said (laughs) but my aunt was so horrified and she called her a slut it was like a whole thing yeah anyway (laughs) Um, yeah, so, so that's a thing. And so at this place, this guy becomes like the most popular guy. And then the, you know, the detective agency is like, uh, don't forget to do your job. It's, it's just like, this is one of those stranger than fiction. Like half the mm. time you're watching and going, is this made up? Like, is this scripted? This can't be real. Right. But it's real. And that's the kind of doc I really love. And, you know, again, the guy's just so charming and the, it's such a funny premise but also bittersweet and I think that's the other thing about docs why why I love them so much is that because they're real life if they're done well and reflect real life they often have that bittersweet feeling like because in real life there's joy and pain there's also joy and pain in docs which Mm -hmm. is what yeah I think real you know like narrative films fictional films are often trying to achieve right so yeah, should I keep going? <laughs> yes, you should keep going. Okay. I keep I'm googling these as you're talking, and they are uh, all adorable old men. I know it's so, so funny. So I have to like okay, so I'm gonna change. I'm gonna change tack. Um, so it's that okay. We get away it's, from... Look, here's the thing: if it turns out that your favorite thing are adorable old men in foreign countries with funny hobbies or with interesting <laughs> hobbies. Um, that's fine. Like, uh, maybe that's kind of, I am a daddy's girl and my dad is 91. So maybe it's a thing, Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to go a different direction. Although there are old men in this next, uh, next suggestion, but they are, um, they're not nice old men. Um, Uh so yeah. They're going to be Nazis, aren't they? Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) But I love that you went there because it is often where I go as well. Um, so, no, funny enough, now I set this up, like, in such an opposite You're way. You're like, oh, now they're not as bad. They're not Nazis. Well, so they're bad guys, no, but they're, they're, not, they're not Nazis. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but also, the, the hilarious part about this, which you had no way of knowing, is that this category is, <laughs> is feel-good docs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, like, I think so. The other, like, I don't want to say misconception, because it, it's, it's a real thing that so many documentaries, especially today are like about very urgent and very dark social issues. Mm-hmm. And I think that like it's critical that these films exist and they, they often move the needle and like, re- like yeah. create real social change. And, and like I'm 100% for it. And it's just not for everyone. And in fact, it's often not for me. You know, I told you earlier, yeah. I love Star Wars and stuff. Like I don't always want to watch like the heaviest, saddest thing in the world. And right. so believe it or not, there are like a whole 
bunch of like feel good inspirational documentaries. Um, again, could go on all day, but the one I am going to talk about, it's called the Eagle Huntress. Um, okay. and this, uh, one's on Disney. Like this is, you know, definitely easily accessible. Um, director Otto Bell, my friend Stacy Reese is the producer and this is a really cool doc. Part of also what's cool about it, I would say, is that not all documentaries are family appropriate. Sure. And this one is, as I mentioned, okay. it's, you know, it's a Disney film. So you can watch it with kids, although it's subtitled. So either you'll need to help help little kids with that or, you know, your kids have to be old enough to read. But anyway, it is about a 13-year-old girl. Mm-hmm. Aishol Pan is her name. And she comes from, uh, they're, in, they're in Kazakhstan, in the mountains of Kazakhstan. She comes from 12 generations of eagle hunters. So this Ooh. is like a big deal in, yeah. in, in the, the mountains. Um, and no boys have ever, uh, excuse me, no girls have ever been trained as eagle mm-hmm. hunters. But... She's the only daughter. Her dad's a champion uh, eagle hunter. Yeah. And she wants to be trained. And he says yes. And the elders, this is where the bad men come in. Mm -hmm. The elders of the community are like, no fucking way. That is not acceptable. And the dad is like, you know what? We're going to we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's this amazing story of like basically she becomes a total champion like she of follows in she her does. father's footsteps and becomes this badass eagle huntress and like again like 13 she's like this little tiny girl and like eagles are big and scary and have claws right and hunting doesn't mean that they they kill them i mean i'm not i won't get into all the like logistics but basically she's like getting these huge eagles to come and land on her arm while she's riding a horse. Mm -hmm. I mean, the shit is crazy. It's amazing to watch. It's super heartwarming, um, especially for the daddy's girls out there. And it is beautifully shot. This is one of those, those stories where the behind the scenes is like just as interesting, which Mm -hmm. I actually didn't like plan on plugging things, but I had interviewed the filmmaker. I could send you a link um, to the video, no film school because they had to to bring like something I don't remember how, an absurd amount of gear, like two thousand pounds worth of gear on a helicopter to the mountains of Kazakhstan to get these you know incredible wintry mountain yeah. shots and action shots you know it requires it requires a, a special type of attention to be able to 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 capture again like this you know the eagle the horse the it's it's not just like standing, pointing a camera at someone for an interview. So anyway, that one yeah. was just like super fun and not not necessarily expected. And I'm clicking through the photographs on IMDb. Oh, do you These, see her? Do you see Aishul Pan? Yeah. yeah. These eagles are half her size. This is what if, I'm saying. People have no idea how big a freaking eagle is. I guess I would say like half her height, but like her torso is the size of an eagle. They are... They could just say, like, you know what? We're hunting you. They are that's right. huge. And she that's why it's a bitchy. challenge. Yeah. Of course. And, you know, imagine their wingspan. Like, if mm-hmm. they turn them on their side, they're probably taller than she is. Absolutely. Yeah. So that is, like, that's a rad movie. Wow. Girl power situation. Um, should I keep going? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So these are, so the, I'm just, I'm just clicking through these, the, the photographs. And the stills are just stunning. It's um, it's so beautifully yeah. shot, and it's also it's just such a beautiful environment. And you know, similar to the truffle hunters, it's like we most of us will never go there. We will mm-hmm. never know what that world is. And here we get this total like total Immersive. peek, yeah. yeah, into it. Um, yeah, and it's funny you said that about the photographs because if I recall correctly, the reason they even made the film is because. The filmmaker like saw a photograph of her with the mm-hmm. eagle and was like, "What is this?" Yeah. So yeah, yeah. The, the fun thing about being a documentary filmmaker is that like real life is always happening, so mm-hmm. you're constantly coming up with ideas or being fed ideas because, you know, you just open the newspaper and there's probably you know several potential films in there. Yeah. Um. So. Oh my gosh! And oh. 
she and her dad went to Telluride with their eagles. Oh, I didn't know that. There's a picture of them in front of the Telluride Film Festival banner, like Main Street, Telluride. The two of them just with their eagles in Main Street. Oh, that is too <laughs> cool. And it makes sense because so, Telluride's a mountain film festival. Mm-hmm. That's funny. Um... Okay. okay, moving so, on. Yeah, moving I'm watching. On. I'm watching this one tonight. I think. Oh, I, I think I'm ordering Thai food. Yes. and I'm watching the Eagle Huntress. Although, if I, there's a Mongolian restaurant in your area, that might be more appropriate. Mm, um, I love that you have to report back. And I, I, I should also just say it. I'm sure people are already expect this, but like in all of these categories, I also had like several <laughs> recommendations. So I'm really working hard to like just pick one. So, and here's what I'll say. Mm-hmm. It's called Finding Favorites because it's a clever name, but it could have been called Something You Love. Mm, Because sometimes people really are worried about upsetting the things they didn't pick. (laughs) Um, Sometimes because they know human beings who made the things they didn't pick. And sometimes because I'm mostly talking to my filmmaker friends. (laughs) So I'm like, I also loved your film. I promise. Yes. Yes. Um, So uh, just to all the filmmakers listening today, this is finding favorites colon something you love. <laughs> so Liz loves you even if she didn't name you and you can come on my podcast in the future and rebuke her. What a great idea. <laughs> I love that. The documentary filmmakers always have lots of stories. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So I want to bring up another category because we talked earlier about like the the shifting of the times and how mm-hmm. <clears throat> so many more people have the opportunity to document life around them and their yeah. own lives now. And that there's, there, there have always been personal documentaries. Like there's always been like sort of people telling their own story um, or their family stories, but it's become so much more common in, in an area. Uh, it's become so much more common in an era when like we are, we can constantly document ourselves and, you know, mm-hmm. like even, you know, people our age, like our parents might have been like VHS taping our lives. Right. Um, and so now someone could have had their whole life basically documented and maybe maybe make a film about it. And of course, like some of them are really self-indulgent, <laughs> but mm-hmm. many of them are really, really good. Yeah. So um, one of them I want to talk about is uh, is coming out. Like I'm excited to talk about it because it's making its like debut right now. Like it's out there right now. Um, And uh, it's actually in full transparency. I did give notes on a cut of this film, but I'm like really proud because it's by a brand new filmmaker, David Mm Siev. And it's literally winning all the awards. Like it just won a critics choice award last week. Ooh. So the film, it's, it's a weird one to say out loud, um, but it's called bad Axe, not badass. Bad Axe, A-X-E. Okay. Um, which is the name of a town in Michigan, FYI. Oh. Um, so this is a very, like, very American, very timely story about this guy, David Sieve's family. Um, and they live in this rural Michigan town called Bad Axe. And they are Asian American. Um, and uh, they own a restaurant. And the pandemic comes uh, and mm. as we all know, there was a huge rash of anti-Asian yeah. uh, sentiment during the pandemic because for, for a lot of reasons, but in part because it was, you know, we were touting this idea that it came from China and, you know, Trump was calling it the China flu. And mm-hmm. um, there was a huge uptick in, in uh, abusive incidents against Asian Americans. I mean, the irony is that, you know, we're so friggin' ignorant in this country, like <coughs> his family's not from China. They're from Cambodia, right? Um, but it doesn't. It didn't matter. So they they were Asian American, and they were, you know, on one hand facing like all this flack from the community, and on the other hand, uh, there were a lot of community members that had gone, come to their restaurant for a long time and and really came to support them, uh, because it was also regardless of their their family background, just keeping a restaurant alive during the pandemic when mm-hmm. when restaurants were closing left and right and it was hard to get supplies and people didn't want to come eat in person. Right. You know, it, it just like what an incredible story that like only this guy could have told right. because, because it's, you know, his family in this very unique situation that also was like indicative of what so many other people were going through. So 
I love that kind of doc too, where it's a very specific story, but has like a more universal or like more widely understood kind of message. So it's just like really this American family story and it's beautifully done. And again, people are really responding to it. So I'm excited also to have, you know, known this filmmaker in his early stages and see kind of like where he's going to go with his career. So anyway, it's out in theaters now. Yeah. And it, I don't know. January 5th. Is that it? January the, 5th it's going to be well, streaming? January 5th it will be at the Gorton Center in Lake Forest, Illinois at 7 p.m. Nice. So I, I, you know, I searched it and Google always wants to help you see something. So it immediately was like Showtime's near Chicago. Oh, how great. So it is showing. So people search it on Fandango and see if you can find it when it's coming to your town. For sure. I mean, that's exciting, too, because not all docs even get theatrical distribution. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, if you can't see it or if it's not in your town, this one, again, because of all the acclaim and and, um, momentum it has will definitely be coming out uh, on streaming. Yeah. So that's that. And you know what I realized? It's funny because obviously I'm a female filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I am very active in in, um, movements to to raise up female and BIPOC filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Um, And I even am like a really early kind of founding member of a group called Film Fatales, uh, which is for for female directors. And I have not talked about one female director yet. (laughs) It's like I said, it's like it's guy day for me. Um, But there are so many amazing um, female docs, female fronted docs out there. Oh, I did say my friend Stacy produced Eagle Huntress, but that is she's not the director. So um, I will talk about one of my favorite filmmakers in general, but like her stuff is out there. So this is for people that like something a little more unusual. Okay. This category is sort of an up and coming one it's becoming much more um like prevalent in the field and it's called hybrid that can mean a lot of different things but it's essentially like it comes from the idea of being a hybrid between a fictional and a documentary film Mm -hmm. so and 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 what it is you know i told you earlier that i like to check out the films that are kind of like playing with form that are doing something a little different that are maybe Mm -hmm. pushing the envelope. And these are, these are documentaries that are pushing the envelope where, you know, it's asking the question, like, what is real? What is documentary? Um, Often they're kind of poetic. Mm -hmm. So this filmmaker, uh, she's an Israeli American filmmaker named Alma Hartel. Mm -hmm. She also directs fiction work, um, which I think, you know, informs some of this. Um, but basically, she's made a couple of films that are like in this this world of this hybrid world um, worth mentioning and, and that are available are Bombay Beach and Love True. Mm-hmm. And apparently, by the way, it was um, so she she directed the film Honeyland, uh, not Honeyland. Oh, my gosh. Honey Boy. Honey Boy. Now, Honeyland is another uh, film on my list. That's funny. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, Honey Boy is is a fictional account but like the, it's like hybrid in the other way it's a fiction film but it comes from the true story of like Shia LaBeouf's life oh. and he Shia LaBeouf contacted her to work together after seeing Bombay Beach because okay. he was like wow this is this is so fascinating so her first feature doc is called Bombay Beach a more recent one is called Love True and both of them are worth mentioning because basically they're just like super creative in that they are documentaries. They're kind of like the the verite style. You're watching people's lives unfold. But they break out into these constructed formats um, in the middle of the film when you're like totally not expecting it. Like what the hell is going on, which I kind of like. So like in Bombay Beach, for example, there are dance numbers. Oh. So it's not a film about dance and it's not a film about dancers. It's like a... If you've heard of, of what of the place Bombay Beach, it's like this um, super poor community in Southern California that is like um, on the shores of the Salton Sea, which is a man-made sea in the middle of the desert. Actually, I think it's, it's in Colorado or California. Anyway, it's a man-made sea that used to be this vacation destination. And now I have to say, I love the, um, the description on IMDb. I, I wouldn't normally just read you the description, but the IMDb description says that... Um, the Salton Sea used to be um, a beautiful destination vacation for the privileged and is now a pool of dead fish. 
Mm. Mm. So anyway, she's just documenting the lives of these people that, you know, some people that live in this wild place. But in the middle of scenes of just like of their lives, there's like these breakout dance numbers that she worked on them with. Uh, She worked with them on. And I guess it was sort of like a way to like express their internal dialogue and their thoughts and feelings. Right. So like it's still documentary in that like you're still getting to know these real people and their real lives. But she's like expressing who they are Mm -hmm. in a way that's constructed. And this sounds maybe a little bit esoteric, but I just find it so interesting. And the way she does it is like really, really cool. And in Love True, it's kind of similar. It's a it's a it's a movie about love. Um, and she's following three love stories, and and that love is very broadly defined. It's, it's yeah. not necessarily a typical love story, but in that one, she used some sort of like like devised theater kind of like psychiatry techniques, and had the characters like like kind of recreate theatrically recreate some of the of their own stories. Yeah. So again, in the middle of what feels like a typical cinema verite documentary, it breaks out into these scenes where you're like, what the hell? Like you're kind of watching someone's dream happening on screen, starring them. Yeah. It's some wild stuff. And she's just, she's just interesting. So I, I, I recommend um, checking her work. Also her website is wild. Oh, I haven't seen it, but I know she does a lot of weed. Um, (laughs) It's a lot of like multi layered. It's got a real MySpace vibe. Oh, fun. With My like MySpace. Wow. Yeah. Um, and okay. also, she is, she okay. could play um, Tori Amos in a movie. Um, yeah. Side note, she's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Like amazing skin. It's, uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Can I do like two more? Two more to bring us home. Okay. No. Okay. So what I'm going to do is because I'm thinking these are all kind of like serious. I don't want to end on a total serious note, Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to bring up one more, probably the most serious one that I have. And then we'll end with fun. How's that? Okay. Great. Okay. So um, the other, I think very like typical, you know, oh, this is a documentary is a biopic. Like it's a story about someone's life. Um. And, you know, we've we've had these in pop culture, too, forever. Like, you think of, like, Behind the Music or something. Like, yeah. they've been cool ones. Um, I think the biopic has gotten much more creative in recent years. And mm-hmm. um, one that I really just loved and was so, like, gutting. Just It's, it's a hard watch. It's not a light watch, and it's not children appropriate. But okay. it's called I Am Not Your Negro. And it's okay. a 2016 documentary actually made by a Haitian filmmaker, Raoul Peck. Um, and, and what's so interesting about this is the, 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 the subject is James Baldwin. Uh, if people don't know him, he's like yeah. a, you know, a very um, prolific Amer- black American writer and kind of civil rights activist. Um, and he, before he died... He had like an unfinished manuscript about, yeah, about like several other civil rights leaders who he was like in the circles with, in the social circles with like Med Grevers and Malcolm X and MLK of these like really pivotal figures in in civil rights in in this country. Um, And he never finished the book. So this filmmaker, I don't exactly know how he came upon the manuscript, but he essentially like finished the book for for James Baldwin by creating this film like this film is like the the film version realization from another creative of this other creative's work which in itself is like such an interesting concept um and he did this with just like incredible archival footage but also really beautiful graphics and this amazing kind of narration voiceover by Samuel L. Jackson and it's just like really lyrical and and it's such an unusual like it's such a unique film that it's sort of hard to describe but it also is going through some of you know America's most challenging social moments 
and then like resonates so sharply still today, like the issues that are d covered, that it's just like, it feels so relevant, but it's also just an incredible watch. Um, so I remember when it came out, but I don't think I knew, like I knew it was about James Baldwin. Um, but I didn't hear any of that backstory about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I just, I guess I just thought it was a straight up a biopic, more, right? straight up biopic. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. is why I am bringing it up. Yeah. Um, and also if people just want like fun, like more fun and, and more, more standard, but like, like holiday watch type biopics. I really um, love the the partnership. Also, these are friends, but um, Julie Cohen and Betsy West, they have like created this sort of like whole canon of like documentaries about badass women. So probably mm -hmm. a lot of people have heard of RBG, the film RBG that yep. you know, got such a big, um, you know, a lot of attention about Ruth Bader oh, Ginsburg. I, I saw that one and I saw that one in the theaters where we like were in the last row at the oh. top of the theater because it was sold out oh my it gosh did you love yeah. it yeah it was really interesting that's when i mean she was still alive when that came out it was right yeah i saw yeah. the premiere at sundance and she came Ooh, wow it was awesome but um but anyway they've also made these other films about like julia childs and civil oh. rights activist Polly murray and the most recent one is um about congresswoman gabby giffords the congresswoman who got yep got shot and they're just like those are, well, that one's pretty serious, but right. like these are, you know, they, they have this like kind of like women biopic genre going and they're really good at it. Um, so those are, you know, just another sort of recommend on the completely opposite side of the spectrum. Yep. To wrap up on a fun yes. note, you know, I have to go full circle because my first doc, you know, Jericho's Echo mm -hmm. was a music documentary, like I said, about the punk scene in Tel Aviv. Um, and music docs are really like, my first love um and i didn't really talk too much about them because that could have been like a subset of finding favorites we could have right. done the whole episode on music docs so i will just say everybody knows what a music documentary is there's tons out there and they're so fun and my bone to pick with music documentaries the ones i don't like are where the documentary doesn't meet the excitement of the music like mm -hmm. if the music and the movement it's part of is more interesting than the documentary itself, there's a right. fail and there's yeah. a lot of those, but there are also so many good ones. Um, one of the most recent that has gotten tons of attention, it's on Hulu, is um, Summer of Soul. Do you okay. know that one? No. So this is cool. This is the first feature directed by Questlove, uh, the musician from The Roots. Yeah. Um, and now he's like Mr. Filmmaker. Like he's he's got several projects in the works apparently. But um this is fascinating because it is about the Harlem Cultural Festival in 1969, mm -hmm. which was like a series of concerts that happened in Harlem, in, in New York City, where I live, um, in 69, like around the same exact time Woodstock was going on. And it's kind of fascinating oh. because we haven't really heard about this. Right. And yet it was a it was a festival where like some of the most influential um, musicians of our time played um but they were black and it just right. it never got the sort of traction even though of course you know Jimi hendrix and others played at woodstock but this was this sort of like homegrown festival that was just incredible and as i keep oh, mentioning and it, you know, over the course of six weeks like it was the whole yeah, summer yeah it was like this this That's ongoing amazing. concert a uh, series of concerts and like all over the map in terms of the t the types of music um, that that were that were played, but you know this is one of those another kind of like behind the scenes is so interesting. Um, essentially, like somebody filmed it for public television, nothing ever really came of it. The boxes sat in someone's basement. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody was cleaning up, like the typical story. They found this, these these rolls of film, and were like, "Hey, wow. what's this?" And basically, like essentially, ultimately, Questlove was like handed this material, like I bet you'll be interested in this, <laughs> and he made this just film where you're like holy shit like this was this pivotal cultural moment that we're finding out about now yeah. you know 50 years later um and some of the footage is just so amazing and like these artists that are so ubiquitous now you're seeing them in their really really young mm -hmm. days and like you're seeing huge crowds uh you know huge black crowds in harlem just like loving it loving the summer you know we we so often see about the social unrest of that time so it's really beautiful to see just like 
people just loving it and having a great time and it doesn't feel you know any kind of way other yeah. than like this is beautiful and and musical and soulful and fun so that one is just that's a fun watch um and an eye-opening watch as well um and then there's just you know there's a million music documentaries so uh i recommend just like kind of poking into that genre for people it's, it's another one of where like if you haven't watched a lot of documentaries it's like a good entry point it's like an accessible mm -hmm. you know an accessible kind of subgenre Ah, this is such, you've given us such a good list of things to watch on winter break. I'm so excited about that. And I'm so excited that we did this and that yes. and you've given me so much time to chat about favorites. And um, I love it. You're one People... of my favorites. So it all works out well. I can't wait till I get to see you again. I've got to get to New York next year. One of us will get to the other place yeah. uh, soon. Or like maybe we should go meet in the Bahamas. I don't know. I, I mean, also fun. that. Yeah. Also the Bahamas. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. So I, I will be happy to send you some links to these films. And, you know, if the if the world demands it, if your crowd wants more recommendations, I can, you know, also send a list for the site. Amazing. But, where where can people find you on the Internet? Oh, that's fun. Um, I mean, I'm at LizNord.com. That's probably the, the easiest way. I, I'm really... Um, really into photography, street photography and, and no casual photography. Mm -hmm. It's it's a way to sort of keep up my creative practice without having to, um, you know, make a film that takes five years. So Instagram's a good place to find me. And I'm just Great. at Liz Film. But thank you so much. This has been really a wonderful conversation. Thank you and happy holidays. Merry Christmas to all the listeners yes. who are listening on Christmas. I don't know. <laughs> it's Merry Christmas. It's Merry Last Night of... Um, Hog, I think I think it's the last night of Hanukkah. Yeah, it might be the night before, but either way, yeah. yes. May it really your holiday season be merry and bright, whatever you celebrate, or even if you don't celebrate anything. This real perfect uh, overlap of Christmas and Hanukkah this year ruined my Hanukkah party, oh. which is traditionally the Saturday night of Hanukkah. But that's I have Christmas a big party. Eve. It's Christmas Eve. Oh, darn. and I will be with my family. Right. So. Oh, and well, I don't. I love we'll see if my cast, sister so. allows me <laughs> to cook lockies in her kitchen. I don't know. Um, they do stink up the place, but they're so they delicious. They really do. Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah. gonna try um, cheddar latkes this year just to make latkes more fattening. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.